Hello, class. Today we're doing the Euthyphro, one of Plato's most famous dialogues. This means we're going to explain the difference between a definition and an example. Hopefully we can distinguish them by definition and not by example. Also, the famous Euthyphro problem. Did philosophers make such a big deal about it because it's fun? Or is it fun because philosophers made such a big deal about it? Finally, do you care for the gods in the same way that you might care for a dog or a cat? If so, I'm canceling my plan to adopt an ancient Greek god. Dr. Bauer's office hours here. Here's some study guide questions. 1. What is Socrates being tried for? 2. Which charge is Euthyphro facing? 3. What is Euthyphro's first answer to Socrates' question, what is piety? And what might be wrong with it? 4. What is Euthyphro's second answer to Socrates' question, what is piety? And what might be wrong with it? 5. What is Euthyphro's third answer to Socrates' question, what is piety? 6. What might be wrong with saying that the god's approval is value responsive? 7. What might be wrong with saying that the god's approval is value conferring? 8. What is Euthyphro's fourth answer to Socrates' question, what is piety? And what is wrong with it? All right. As always, you'll want to have a pad of paper and a pencil, or a laptop, or some means of recording information as we go through this lecture. Like many dialogues, the Euthyphro is named after one of its principal characters. In this case, a priest of the gods, who is prosecuting his own father for murder that Socrates meets over at the Athenian courthouse. Socrates, as you may know, was facing charges of corrupting the youth by getting the youth to abandon their beliefs in the old gods and to accept beliefs in new, made-up gods. When we consider what we know about Socrates and the process of Olenkis, which I've covered in another video, it's likely that Socrates may have been challenging the anthropomorphism of the religion of his time. In his time, it was popular to say that Justice, Athena, DK, is a woman with a shield and a spear and she fights stuff, rah, whereas Justice, according to someone who is thinking like Socrates, would not be like that at all. And if you started to do a Lenkis on the topic of justice, you'd soon distinguish it from the popularly celebrated anthropomorphic deity. That could have been what got him in trouble. Or something else. In any case, Socrates is charged with corrupting the youth, and Euthyphro is charging his own father with murder. His father, as Euthyphro explains, killed a slave, or at least allowed a slave to die through negligence. Now, the Athenian ruling class was a slave-owning class, and like many slave-owning classes, if not all, they were relatively unconcerned with the well-being of their slaves. So, the accidental death of one of them would be seen as an expense, but probably not murder. The fact, therefore, that Euthyphro was prosecuting his father for murder over the death of a slave shows that Euthyphro was going against traditional conventions. It would be very unconventional for someone to prosecute their own family, especially their own father, in a patriarchal society over the death of a slave. Socrates confirms this by reacting with disbelief, your own father. And this brings up the topic of whether Euthyphro knows exactly what he's doing, right? The gods are thought to be the final arbiters of what's fair and what's unfair, and the manner of doing what the gods approve of is thought of as piety. Piety or reverence or holiness then becomes the topic. Socrates exclaims that, oh, if only he knew what piety was, that way he would do better in court and be able to defend himself by showing that what he was doing was indeed pious. So he asks Euthyphro, Ta'estin, what is? What is piety? 
Euthyphro gives a series of answers, Socrates rebuts each one, and eventually Euthyphro says, oh my goodness, I'd better get going, look at the time, and the dialogue promptly ends. Euthyphro's first answer is an answer by example. Socrates asks, what is piety? And Euthyphro's response is, well, it's what I'm doing right now. I am prosecuting a murderer. That's pious. So piety is, you know, that. Socrates gives an answer which is at once commonsensical, but it's also very, very, very deep. Here's why the answer is important and deep, is that throughout all of Plato's works, we never get a real characterization of what the forms are. Remember, Plato's theory of the forms is his most famous contribution to all of Western thought, to all of Western philosophy. But we don't have a dialogue on the forms. The closest that we have is the Parmenides, and that's wrapped up with other concerns as well. Often, when Plato brings up the forms, he'll do so with a brief list. He'll say, truth, goodness, beauty, and all that kind of reality, wouldn't you agree? Something like that. Very rare do we get an account of what the forms are. A logos of Aide, if you will. We know Socrates is indeed looking for a form, and he characterizes it here. Bear in mind, then, that I did not bid you tell me one or two of the many pious actions, but that form itself that makes all pious actions pious. For you agreed that all impious actions are impious, and all pious actions pious through one form. Or don't you remember? He goes on, Tell me then what this form itself is, so that I may look upon it, and using it as a model, say that any action of yours or another's that is of that kind is pious, and if it is not that, it is not. So we get something like a definition of what a form is. The form of piety, in this case, does two things. One, it makes all the actions which are pious, pious. In other words, if you take all the actions which are pious and you say, hey, what makes them pious? The form would be some one feature they have in common, a feature that explains why they are all pious, in that sense, makes them pious. Secondly, the form of piety is something such that once you know it or look upon it, you'll be able to reliably detect its instances. So we can say in general that for any feature X, the form of X explains why all of the X things are X, and it's something such that when you know it, you can reliably identify the X's. That's something that we're going to appeal to as we continue to study Plato. So much for Euthyphro's first answer, then. It won't do. Euthyphro cannot say that piety is just doing what he's doing, because you could do other things. An example is one thing, but Socrates wants a definition. It would be like if I asked you what food is. Perhaps I'm from another planet or something, and I say, what is food? And if you say to me, well, chicken wings are food, there's a sense in which you would be right, chicken wings are indeed among the foods, but there's a sense in which you would be wrong, too. Not all food is chicken wings. Maybe unfortunately. The idea is that, well, I wanted a definition. I wanted to know what all the foods have in common that make them foods. I wanted to know some standard where, once I've got it, I can tell whether something is food. I wanted to know the form of food in that case. And just as the answer, chicken wings, would be deficient if I were asking what food is, so is Euthyphro's first answer deficient. Let's go on to the second. The second answer gets things better. Euthyphro says that what's pious is what the gods love. And that kind of makes sense if you consider the concept of what's reverent. Reverence is the idea of pleasing God or doing what God wants. So presumably, in a polytheistic society like Athens, piety is doing what the gods want. It's what the gods like. That's what piety is. Piety is what the gods love. That's Euthyphro's second answer. Piety is what the gods love. The problem, of course, is that, as Socrates points out, 
the gods disagree on various things. Consider marital infidelity because of a moment of passion. That's something that Hera famously disagrees with Aphrodite about. Maybe Paris and Helen see each other, and in a moment of passion, absolutely want to do something about it. And Aphrodite would say, oh yeah, absolutely. And Hera would say, no way, uh-uh. So they would disagree over whether that thing is lovable. Is it pious? Is it not pious? Is it both? Is it neither? It's a problem. It's a contradiction. And so for many things. Thievery. You would think thievery is bad, but then Hermes is the god of thieves. If we just say that the pious is what the gods love, we have this issue where some gods love some things and other gods love other things. The most natural way to address this objection and to amend the account is what Euthyphro takes. Euthyphro's third answer, perhaps the most famous one because of the response, is to say that the pious or piety is just whatever all the gods love. Sure, maybe this one affair between Helen and Paris was uh, uh, controversial among the gods, and sure, maybe this one occasion of thievery is controversial among the gods, but hey, if all the gods agree that this is bad, it's definitely impious. And if all the gods agree that this is good, hey, it's definitely pious. That's the third answer. That's Euthyphro's third answer to Socrates' question of what piety is, is it's what all the gods love. That's what's pious. The reason why this response is deficient is, in fact, the famous Euthyphro problem. The Euthyphro problem is the problem of asking whether the love of the gods, whether their approval, is value conferring or value responsive. Socrates, using a series of analogies about seeing and carrying, arrives at this sort of a question. Are pious actions loved by the gods because they are pious? Or are those actions pious because they are loved by the gods? In other words, does the fact that the gods love those actions, does that make those things pious? Do the gods, as it were, cause things to be pious just by liking them? Right? They go around and they say, ah, I like that, and zap, it becomes pious as a result of their liking it. Right? Or is it this, that there's already some pious stuff out there in the world, all by itself, it's already pious, the gods just come along, notice it, and then approve. In that latter case, the gods' approval would be value-responsive. The gods would be approving in response to the piety that's already there. To simplify matters, people often phrase the Euthyphro problem this way. Does God love something because it's good? Or is something good because God loves it? If God's love is value-conferring, that means that God's loving it makes it good. It's good because God loves it. If God's love is value responsive, that means God loves it because it's good. This is the question of whether value explains or is explained by the God's love. This is the Euthyphro problem. It's famously a problem for any philosopher that wishes to build a moral foundation on divine commands. Any philosopher, in other words, who wants to be a divine command theorist in ethics, who says that morality just is what God or the gods say, and that's all you need to know about ethics. This is a problem for such an account. It asks whether the gods command something because it's good, or is it good because the gods commanded it? That's the question. Or to put it the other way, is the love of the gods value responsive, or is it value conferring? Let's consider the first option. Imagine that the gods' love made stuff pious. In other words, imagine just by liking stuff, it became good. It started out and it was neutral. It wasn't pious, it wasn't impious, it was just bland, normal, valueless stuff. Then the gods come along and agree, hey, this is good. 
and zing, it's pious, right? What would be wrong with that account? Well, the first problem is, of course, the gods, it seems, could have liked anything. If all that it takes for something to be pious is for the gods to have liked it, well, they could have liked the most horrible bloodthirsty things, and then those would have been the pious things. What's to stop them from doing that? If your answer is, oh no, those things were already bad independently of what the gods like, oh no, that's not what we're allowed to say if we're assuming that the gods' love is value conferring. And this is the second problem with saying that the gods' love is value conferring, is that there appears to be no reason, or at least no specifiable reason, for why the gods would like things. It's not crazy to think that the reason why God likes something is because it's good. After all, that's why it makes sense to get God to like you by being good, right? The idea is that God responds to your goodness, and so that's how you get approval, is by God responding to it. If it turns out that God's approval is what makes the thing good, that raises this question of why God approved of that, and no answer seems to be found. The God's approval seems foundationless, unprincipled, arbitrary, and absurd. Why do the gods like this? No reason. Eesh. So much for that option. But if we take the other option and say that the pious is what the gods respond to with approval, in other words, if we say that the gods like things because they are already pious, well, then, telling us that the pious is what all the gods love does not tell us what makes something pious. Socrates wanted to know what makes something pious. What's the feature that constitutes piety? What's the thing that all the pious actions have in common? If you say, the pious is what the gods love, that only tells me that the gods are approving of that feature which I have yet to understand and know. Consider the following analogy. I want to know what it is for something to be metal. Suppose I'm a bizarre, nascent chemist of sorts. I'm curious about the chemistry of metals, and I want to know, what is it that makes something metal? What is metal, exactly? And suppose you gave me this answer. It's what metal detectors beep near. Is that a correct answer? Well, in a sense, indeed, metal detectors will beep near all and only metals, so in that sense, you are correctly picking out all and only the metals, if that's how you define metal. But there's also a sense in which this answer is wrong. The fact that a metal detector beeps near something is not the feature that makes it metal. That's not what causes it to be metal. It's being metal is some other feature, that the metal detector is responding to. Saying that metal is what metal detectors beep near does not tell you anything about what it is to be metal. Likewise, saying that the pious is what the gods approve of does not tell you what piety is. It tells you that the pious is some feature which is reliably approved of by the gods, but it doesn't tell you what they're responding to. Any more than saying metal is what metal detectors beep near tells you what exactly the metal detector is responding to. That's why Euthyphro's third answer is deficient. It's because of the Euthyphro problem. A dilemma in which either the love of the gods is value conferring, in which case their love becomes mysterious, inexplicable, and arbitrary, or the love of the gods is value responsive, in which case it doesn't tell us anything about what piety is. The fourth and final answer that Euthyphro gives before ultimately giving up and running away is that piety is care for the gods, or concern for the gods. That's what reverence for the gods is, is care for them, concern for them. And that makes sense in a kind of intuitive, folksy way. What problem does Socrates have with that? Well, again, there's a dilemma. Socrates asks whether by care for the gods, one means 
in the same way that one might care for livestock, you know, improving them. When I care for a dog or a cat or a cow or a sheep, I am making sure that it doesn't get sick, I am keeping it healthy, I am maintaining its best conditions, and I am assisting it in its general condition of life in addition to whatever I might use it for. And Socrates asks, oh, do you mean care for the gods like you care for a cow or a sheep? And of course Euthyphro says, no, because a god, reason Socrates, a god must be whatever's best. The gods are the best. You can't make them better or improve on them or help them out. That would be absurd. That's not the kind of role that the gods play. Right? You cannot say that piety is caring for the gods in the sense of making the gods better because the gods are already best, so you cannot make them better. That's why piety cannot be care for the gods in that sense. But the only other thing that one could mean, indeed, the only other thing that Euthyphro could mean in saying that piety is care for the gods is this, doing whatever the gods want. Or in other words, whatever the gods approve of. And again, we've been down that road. If piety was just doing whatever the gods approve of, then the very next question would be, why are the gods approving of that? What's the feature had by all the things they approve of that makes them approve of it? And we would be asking the same question as before. So what's wrong with Euthyphro's fourth answer, piety is care for the gods? Well, either care for the gods means making them better and caring for them like livestock, or it means doing what they approve of. If caring for them means making them better like you might care for livestock, that goes against the very idea of what it is to be a god. Gods are best. But if care for the gods means doing whatever they approve of, that has yet to tell us why they approve of those things. It has yet to tell us what piety is. And so again, we, as Socrates describes, move around in a circle. At this point, Euthyphro, and perhaps also the reader, has had enough. Maybe you've had enough too, but before we go, ask yourself this. Which horn of the Euthyphro dilemma, that is, which problematic option in the Euthyphro problem is the easier one to deal with? Which one would you pick if you had to pick one of them? I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.